Sono molto lieto, benvenuti ancora, buongiorno. Sono lieto di presentare ancora il professor Towner. L'altro giorno ho menzionato mh, il suo contributo mh, a livello internazionale all'Ounida Institute, diversi contributi per la traduzione della Bibbia nelle Americhe e in altri posti. Ho menzionato mh, la sua ricerca nella prima e seconda Timoteo e il contributo alle tre pastorali e non ho menzionato un contributo che è importante per noi nella rivista biblica del 2020, una delle produzioni più recenti, a proposito della seconda Timoteo, Cowardice and the Specter of Betrayal, The Intersection of Intertextuality and Paranomasia. E lo menziono perché? Perché ecco, tra i contributi del professore Towner, lo abbiamo già percepito quando lo abbiamo sentito l'altro giorno, per noi è anche importante la parte metodologica, questo incrocio di intertestualità come approccio di lettura ai testi che quando legge Seconda Timoteo adopera anche l'incrocio tra intertestualità e analisi retorica. Mm, ecco, sono molto lieto di presentarvi ancora oggi il professore Philip Towner. Benvenuto. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I am glad to have this chance to uh, share with you some of the work that I have done. Um, just as I did on Wednesday with Second Thessalonians, I will begin with an introduction to uh, some of the important works that have shaped the study of the pastoral epistles today. Uh, I, I have a, a, a few examples. That, that I will give, and um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm shying away from a kind of full review of literature because I don't think you want that or need that, and the monographs I mentioned do that for us, but the monographs chosen have um, really set the pace and established the directions that are being taken today in the study of the pastorals. Uh, and and it, it also will set up uh, the last half of my paper where I want to take you into something fresh. So any attempt today to describe trends of research in the pastoral epistles has to begin by at least naming some of the assumptions that are hardly questioned anymore chief among these would be that the letters are pseudepigraphal or pseudonymous, inauthentic. This is taken by many, especially, well, back, back in my, back in my uh, PhD days, we referred to this as the German view. It's certainly not that now, it's a majority view in, in uh, in Anglophone work and German work. Um, but in any case, it's reached the point where no one even talks about it anymore. They just assume it and begin to, begin to move forward. Um, it is not the situation that I described with respect to Second Thessalonians, which is much more difficult to, certainly much more difficult to describe Second Thessalonians as a pseudepigraphal work. In this respect, the pastoral epistles pose a challenge for scholarship, again, different from Second Thessalonians, something similar to Second Peter. Although despite the confidence of those supporting this majority view, it is not without its problems, and I would um, refer you to any work done by Luke Johnson on the pastoral epistles, and even his recent two-volume work that is in process of coming out, which uh, is essentially L Luke gathering together all of the work he has done on, uh, on the Pauline letters and looking at them canonically. Uh, he does treat the pastoral letters within the Pauline corpus. For those like myself who adopt a view of authorship between the two extremes, 
uh, and that's a difficult thing to try to do. Uh, we have had to just get on with research while leaving the question of authorship open somehow, and we get away with it. But in the end, people want to know uh, what is the status of the pastoral letters. On the whole, given the fluidity of the matter of authorship, even in the case of the undisputed Paulines, and open to the possibility that the pastoral epistles may have been written by a close Pauline co-worker, authorship can no longer be made simply a matter of authenticity equals authority, or forgery equals some kind of secondary status. In either case, the pastoral epistles represent a significant experiment in, I would say, the late first century um, at the latest, possibly within the, the period of Paul's own time. Uh, but however we regard the matter of authorship, the, the pastoral epistles represent a significant experiment in contextualizing Paul for a somewhat later situation, and from which we can learn something about the reception of Paul by churches forced into a transitional mode by the apostles' departure. My own research questions are designed to explore how these New Testament letters pre present themselves, which is to say, how their author meant them to be read. What was the story he was telling? and specifically to get at this question by examining, one, how the earlier Pauline letters and other biblical and non-biblical traditions figure in the pastoral epistles, and how the characters or personalities who populate these letters, Paul, Timothy, Titus, the opponents, as well as the silent participants or members of the communities for whom the pastoral epistles were written, my interest is in how the pastoral letters are, in a literary sense, constructed. My approach to such matters has been, um, and not really by my own choosing, but it has been through the literary phenomenon of intertextuality. And I say not by my own choosing because at least, I would say, at least one of the uh, monographs I will introduce has now set intertextuality as a, a part of the methodology that simply can't be ignored. And frankly, we have been reading the New Testament intertextually, all of us, ever since we've started to read it. We just didn't know it. We didn't have the name for that. Now we do. But what do I mean by this? Recent research on the pastoral epistles has profited from the observation that these three New Testament letters present a figure of Paul and his teaching in a new light as compared with the undisputed Pauline writings. We are confronted with a Paul who does not shy away from presenting himself or the importance and uniqueness of his apostolate for the Gentiles in elaborate ways. And the elaboration is a product of intertextual reflection in the construction of the characters that populate these letters. And this would be the focus of, of my own study following an introduction to some of the significant contributions of recent and current scholarship. By intertextuality, I mean the creative mode of literary construction by which previous texts known to author and audience, but sometimes activated unconsciously, are drawn into later discourses, reworked, revised, reconsidered, and so on, to produce new meaning in the recipient text, or in this case, in the pastoral epistles. While the fact that all poetic texts, in fact, all human discourse, uh, are constructed of other texts, and dependent in some way on other texts has meant for the post-structuralist interpreter that textuality implies instability, polyvalence of meaning, and so on. In my view, intertextuality means enhancement of meaning, and instability or polyvalence 
if it is present in a text, marks out a space of exegetical discovery, not despair. In the case of the pastoral epistles, intertextuality involves engagement with earlier Pauline texts and the growing oral traditions that were circulating in the early churches. It involves the Old Testament and particularly as we have it in a Greek translation, as well as wider Hellenistic Jewish traditions and also the traditions and the stories uh, surrounding the churches, those of the polis and of the empire. Now, recent work on the pastoral epistles. I want to briefly introduce the work of three scholars, which exemplifies what I take to be the current state of scholarship in the pastoral epistles. Hannah Stetler on Christology, Annette Mertz, on reception history of the pastoral epistles as discerned through the study of intertextuality, and Michaela Engelman on the literary relationship of the pastoral epistles. Stetler's work was published in 1998, Mertz's in 2004, and Engelman's in 2012. There are several commentaries that have appeared since about 2015, but generally the commentary genre is better suited to evaluating the focused scholarly contributions that come by way of journal articles and the intensive work in monographs and dissertations. And frankly, the commentaries I have in mind, although they are thick and have many pages and lots of words, they reflect a sort of reshuffling of scholarly views and ideas already in circulation uh, into different configurations. Each of the authors I've mentioned, uh, these monograph authors, wrote in German. Each is thorough. Each models for seasoned scholars and doctoral students alike what it means to do a review of literature. While the first two especially may seem dated, getting on to 20 years now, all three set patterns that determine the direction of current scholarship. In terms of authorship, and this shouldn't be a surprise, each belongs to what I have called the majority view. The pastoral epistles for them are pseudonymous, inauthentic, serving a different purpose from the uh, earlier Paulines. And from this starting point, each work involves looking closely at the relationship between the pastoral epistles, their language, tradition, interests, and the earlier Paul as a way of understanding the pastoral epistles as evidence of how in post-Pauline times, though the interval assumed to exist between Paul and the pastoral epistles uh, varies, but to understand the earlier Paul as a way uh, of under, understanding the use of the earlier Paul in the pastorals as a way of understanding the pastorals as evidence um, of how in post-Pauline times the apostles' teaching and theology were received, reshaped, and revised in Pauline churches after his death. Although I disagree at many points with the detailed exegesis of these scholars, but that's just the way of exegesis and scholarship. And like Luke Johnson, I continue to have questions about the so-called assured results of the majority view. Still, the pastoral epistles do reflect transition. And the only way to measure this development is by close examination of their presentation and construction of the apostle and his teaching. This task, which remains fundamentally an exegetical task that reads and interprets the New Testament text in its linguistic and historical contexts, must include the tools of literary criticism and social history. It must include close readings of the pastoral epistles in relation to earlier Pauline writings and in relation to the post-apostolic writings that received and con contextualized Paul in the second century. 
Engelman's work is taken up with the literary dynamics among the three letters. Her title is a question, which I translate as, are the pastoral epistles inseparable triplets? Which indicates the direction of her study and anticipates its outcome. She concludes that the three letters are individual writings and were not composed nor necessarily received only as a corpus or a trilogy, if you will. By examining the motifs, language, and interests of each letter in its own right, the individuality and also the interrelatedness of each to the other can be appreciated. Her work proceeds by way of key themes and the language used to express them, Christology and soteriology, ecclesiology, heresy or heresiology, and the so-called portrait of Paul in the pastoral epistles. After her close examination, she concludes that each letter was written for its own concrete situation. Each assumes a specific past shared in common by author and audience, but also that the three letters share much language and an author in common. She argues that one Timothy is in a sense dependent on or exerts a sort of literary influence over the two shorter letters. It is the language of one Timothy that reveals it to be the letter that causes the others to cohere and allows the three to have a literary life together. I would suggest that this thesis of literary dependence needs further investigation by means of the examine of intertextuality along the lines I followed in considering the relation of 2 Thessalonians to 1 Thessalonians. And maybe that's a part of my work going forward. We will see. Stettler's work on Christology. Her work, which also begins with an important review of the research into Christology of the pastoral epistles, is ultimately aimed at determining the character, Pauline or other, and the sources of the Christological statements in the pastoral epistles. She writes before intertextuality as a technical term had become popular in German biblical scholarship. But her technique is similar, tracing key phrases and terms and whole traditions back to the earlier Pauline writings, as well as to the synoptics and the Johannine tradition. After exegeting, after exegeting the key texts, she considered one, the motivating circumstances, chiefly the need to shape a Christology to address heresy. Two, the chief sources, Paul, Synoptics, Acts, and John. And three, the key motifs and Christologies that are borrowed and adapted, preexistence and incarnation, servant of God, Son of Man Christology, etc., and how they are shaped into charismatic statements. Her conclusions are naturally open to question at many points, but her methodology is solid. That is to say, any of us or any student could take the methodology and probably come up with a different set of results, but the methodology, I think, is tried and tested and it is solid. I won't say anything more about her work at this point, but so far we have seen two crucial problems in the pastoral epistles addressed by these two monographs. One is the inter interrelationship um, and the individuality of the letters in relation to one another, and second, the question of Christology. How indebted is it to Paul, uh, earlier Paul, and otherwise, uh, what are some of the other sources? And how is the Christology shaped for the situations as she has reconstructed them? 
The work of Annette Meritz moves Stettler's discussions and conclusions into a different mode, suggesting that intertextuality, a key technique for the pseudepigrapher, she argues, can say more about how sources and traditions can be reshaped for later use and authenticated as Pauline by a fictional Paul who inserts himself into the pastoral epistles as Paul. I have left Mertz's work until last uh, because a brief description of her project will provide a useful introduction or framework for my own. Her main theme is the fictional self-reference or self-interpretation of Paul in the pastoral epistles. This referencing of Paul, that is the depicting of a certain Paul, a Paul who is sketched in a certain way, is produced by intertextual engagement with earlier Pauline texts and traditions and by engagement with the Old Testament and the Jesus tradition. She is interested to explore the role of intertextuality in the construction of the pastoral epistles as indicative of the reception of Paul by Pauline churches after him and up to the letters of Polycarp and Ignatius, who use the Pauline collection and include the pastoral epistles in the Pauline collection. What I want to set out briefly is the framework of her study for the importance of her study is less a matter of her specific exegetical conclusions and more the careful construction of a methodology. And so again, the value I see in each of these monographs is uh, they have worked hard to create a methodology that in a sense stands the test of time. Even though if anyone else is to take up that methodology and proceed with it, they may come with different results. She argues that intertextuality is a key to understanding pseudepigraphal writings. In the past, the relation of such a writing to its authentic counterpart might come under the category of literary dependence. She updates this notion by redefining literary dependence in terms of the theory of intertextuality. This might seem puzzling. After all, is not intertextuality a kind of synonym for literary dependence. But what is meant is that when a text in the pastoral epistles engages with a source and draws it into the text being constructed, the meaning of the pretext, a Pauline text, for example, let's say something from Romans, the meaning of that pretext is changed, often by revising it in some observable way. Also, as in earlier Paul, Intertextuality can involve the creation of a pretextual source that is actually a mixed text, formed by bringing two or more Old Testament texts together in an almost midrashic manner. Mertz's work is important for biblical studies because she sets out the history of the development of intertextuality, beginning with French literary criticism she includes the variations of its manifestations and possibilities for interpretation. And she illustrates the range of intertextual contacts by examining instances of intertextuality in the pastoral epistles, from simple to complex, intentional to latent or unconscious. And she introduces the range of possible functions of intertextuality in recipient texts like the pastoral epistles. In the main portion of her work, she maintains that the earlier Pauline letters form the pretext for the pseudepigraphal and intertextual construction of the pastoral epistles. The overall result is the depiction of a specifically fictional and self-interpreted Paul. That is, a certain constructed Paul whose new voice we hear in the pastoral epistles. And through intertextuality, or rather intertextuality, makes the apostle Paul responsible for adaptations and applications of earlier teaching in later and changed circumstances. <clears throat> 
to implement or practice or experiment with her model. She examines texts in the pastoral epistles dealing with slavery in Titus 2, 1 Timothy 6, and the notorious text concerning the role of women in 1 Timothy 2, 11 and following, the latter of which includes engagement with multiple texts in the earlier Pauline writings and in Jewish tradition. In fact, her search for possible relevant pretexts to help explain the puzzling soteriological statement of 1 Timothy 2.15, where it talks about wives being saved through childbearing, is one of the most thorough treatments I have encountered. The contribution here comes in the fact that while most scholars who have dealt with the text or texts like this in commentaries or special studies, for practical reasons, limit their discussions to what they regard as the most probable sources, namely those that suit their interpretive goals. But given her agenda, the role of intertextuality in reshaping Pauline teaching for the pastoral epistles, she is obliged to consider all possible pretexts, and she does. In the case of the text restricting women, she finds the engagement with multiple Pauline texts calculated to produce and secure a definitive Pauline treatment of the matter for the later church. And in this, she argues that intertexts with the earlier Pauline writings play the strategic role as they also demonstrate pseudepigraphy. The safeguarding of this position in, second, uh, in chapter two of 1 Timothy as a Pauline position, she says, takes place with increased connection to authentic Pauline statements and thus shows impressively what an effective means of intertextuality is under the conditions of credible and believed pseudepigraphy. So she does not see pseudepigraphy as forgery. She sees it as a creative um, extension of the apostolic writings for the sake of the post-apostolic uh, generation. Now, I'll mention two more scholars briefly. Two very recent works will illustrate advances in the study of non-biblical uh, non primary sources for the reconstruction of the social history of the pastoral epistles. One younger scholar, Christopher Hoklatobi, living in the USA, has done the most important work that I have seen on piety in the Roman Empire. Its relevance to the pastoral epistles comes in the fact that piety, Eusebia, plays an important role in defining what we might call authentic Christian existence, according to the pastoral epistles. As a result of his work, we're now better able to see in this theme in the pastoral epistles an engagement with the surrounding culture. In the case of 1 Timothy, for example, which presents itself as written to Timothy in Ephesus, the prominent role of piety in the Artemis cult becomes a factor in the meaning of piety for the church. The work of Gary Hoag, another American, his doctoral dissertation turned into a monograph, which seeks to explore the theme of wealth in 1 Timothy, is important because the core of the study is a reading of Xenophon's novella called Ephesiaca. This ancient writing, more or less contemporary with the pastoral epistles, becomes a window onto the language of the Artemis cult, which overlaps significantly with that of the pastoral epistles. So, it, so working in the pastoral epistles is not all intertextuality. It is very much to do, and, and there is as much ongoing work in this area. It has as much to do with uh, reconstructing the social and historical setting of these letters and doing so by way of the primary sources. All right, we're going to now move into uh, some of the work that I have been doing. And, and I reflected just a bit on this. 
Uh, speaking about intertextuality to a group of colleagues like this or in other kinds of settings, uh, I find it to be challenging. Uh, and the reason for it is it's, it's not that uh, I have the sense that anyone doubts the value of in, uh, intertextuality, though many of us would doubt whether or not a particular text is making contact with a pretext or not. But the thing about intertextuality is that it is a very personal matter. You either see it or you don't. You either um, are, are sent to another text because you're familiar with the other text. You either see the connection uh, or don't, but you see it uh, quite apart from the communal nature of the church and the early church especially. Um, each person in, in an audience or each reader needs to catch it um, and if that person doesn't catch it, uh, there's a dimension of the text, we will call it the denotative level, that, ha that has to suffice for that reader. The other part of the difficulty of dealing with intertextuality is it's, it's like one of these things in America we call a buzzword. It's a fad. We'll get over it at some point. But the fact of the matter is that one of the reasons I stress from literary criticism that intertextuality is a component of all texts. And as I've already said, we've been doing intertextual study, whether we use the language or not, forever as biblical scholars. Um, uh, one of the reasons I stress, though, the function of it within literary criticism is because uh, it is simply a part of human discourse. It is a part of speaking in a context, uh, and it it is, a, it is a dynamic of human discourse which brings to human discourse um, enhancement, deeper meaning, more potential, and so forth. To a degree not seen in the earlier Pauline letters, and I think that's key to this, something new is happening in the pastorals. Intertextual engagement with the Old Testament, Jewish traditions, earlier materials from Paul's letters and the Jesus tradition, as well as other local discourses, becomes a means in the pastoral epistles of literary characterization in the sense it is used in literary criticism to create, to sketch the people who are the players and uh, for the interpreting of those players and their concerns by allowing the audience to see them within a range of stories, a cluster of stories, that either form or interfere with the redemptive narrative that structures Paul's thought. I'll go ahead and use the name Paul here uh, for the author of the pastorals. Um, we can put quotes around it, or you can imagine quotes around it. I will divide the following discussion uh, into two parts. One, examples of the character characterization of the opponents and their concerns, and two, examples of the characterization of Paul. I will not treat Timothy's characterization because I've done this in the, I've done this recently in the article in Biblica mentioned uh, in the introduction, a 2020 article. Now I need to get this going. Okay, once again, the slides here are designed just to give you a visual kind of impact. I, I, can't, I can't prove anything with this sort of visual, but it is there because simply to talk about these connections is, uh, well, it's a difficult thing to, 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 to stay, to hold, hold on to the thread of my discourse. Okay, characterization of the opponents will look briefly at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 18 and following, chapter 3, 1 through 9, and I will mention Titus 1. Within the broader passage, which is 2 Timothy 14 to 21, which is designed to guide Timothy uh, in responding to opponents and their harmful doctrines, two 
19, the last two parts of the verse, is a complex intertext that reaches into the story of the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram uh, by citing Numbers 16.5 in the Septuagint uh, in 2 Timothy 2.19. The first, the first citation or con uh, contact comes in the phrase um, in the red there, the Lord knows those who are his. Now this is, this is widely regarded to be making use of numbers, uh, but it is interpreted in various ways. So the first contact in a complex intertextual uh, pretext is the Lord knows those who are his. Where am I here? And in this case, uh, echoing a mix of traditions taken up with the theme of naming the name of the Lord. Going back here to Isaiah 26 and Joel 3, 5. Not there. I'm gonna hit the wrong button here if I'm not careful. Okay, um, and then as you see in slide three, the, um, the next bit of the intertextual contact comes in the phrase separating from wickedness. And the background I give to this uh, possible pretext, uh, Sirach 17 to 20, uh, 1726, Isaiah 52, 11. But as a sort of uh, comparative text in the uh, Pauline writings, 2 Corinthians six seventeen, which is a citation of the Old Testament. Um, okay, while uh, w w despite this spread of context, uh, in Second Timothy, th the author stays within the frame of the number story by an additional echo of the verb for separation. And I have that at the very bottom. Well, starting with 19, you see that red line drip drifting down and the, um, the verb uh, apostato, which connects with apestesan, uh, they're both from the same root. Okay, and, and my suggestion is that despite the fact that um, this is a citation, the main theme here is to be derived probably from numbers. By comparing the co-text, the context of the numbers text and of the intertext, the way it's used in Second Timothy, that is verses 14, through 26 or so, two things become clear. First, this engagement with the Old Testament does more than simply underscore the certainty of God's election and permanence of the church, as some have argued. Second, the efficiency of the complex Old Testament engagement can be readily seen. First of all, the technique characterizes the opponents more thoroughly than simply naming. And Hymenaeus and uh, Philetus are, are mentioned in the verse just above. But the technique of intertextual contact with the number story um, characterizes the opponents more thoroughly than just sort of making them visible through their names alone. They are named in 217 and I would argue they are presented through intertextuality here as repeating or as involved in the same sin of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram in their relation with Moses <clears throat> or in their actually opposition to Moses. Their chief sin is thematized. It is repudi repudiating God's, uh, Paul's God-given authority just as Moses and Aaron's opponents did theirs in the number story. Three, the appropriate response of the believers endangered by the opponent's false teaching is indicated by the verb to separate. And this holds true of the story in numbers and it holds true for this. Uh, for, for the situation that 2 Timothy is addressing. Separate from the rebels, separate from the opponents, 
separate from the false teacher. And fourth, Paul and Timothy may be seen, in a sense, as the counterparts of Moses and Aaron. Now, I'm going to move on to 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 9. 3, 1 to 9 in the same letter is overtly designed to characterize the opponents. It locates them eschatologically in the last days, in chapter 3, verse 1. And you might compare uh, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, which does something similar. So it locates them eschatologically in the condemns their behavior with a long vice list, verses 2 to 4, exposes their false piety, in verse 5, destructive tactics, in verses 6 and 7, and pronounces their ultimate downfall, in verse 9. The characterization reaches a colorful crescendo in the intertextual allusion to the story of Moses' contest with the magicians of Pharaoh. That would take us back to Exodus 7, 1 to 12 and 22, and it's very difficult not for that not to be called to mind as long as you understand who Yanis and Yambres are. Uh, and the language used in 2 Timothy 3, as Yanis and Yambres opposed Moses. The inner text is complex again, evoking both the Exodus narrative which leaves the uh, magicians unnamed, and later Jewish elaborations, which supplied names for these unnamed characters in Exodus. Now, coming on the heels of the reference to the two false teachers in chapter 2, and their association with those who rebelled against Moses and Aaron, the naming of the two magicians again suggests the intertext is a further characterization of Hymenaeus and Philetus. When this is appreciated, the further association of Paul with Moses cannot be far behind. The approach to the false teachers now shifting to uh, 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 5, is similar. Have I given us this or not? Let's see. Not that. There we go. Um, it, it is, in a sense, constructed similarly. It identifies the false teachers with the eschatological or prophetic theme. The Spirit explic uh, explicitly says, um, and then refers to the appearance of the false teachers in later times, which I take to be a more or less synonym for the last days of 2 Timothy 3.1. In contrast, in contrast to the Spirit's prophetic word, the author characterizes their teachings or prophecies in terms of devotion to deceiving spirits and teachings of demons. And the heretics themselves as hypocritical liars with ruined consciences in verse two. Further characterization comes by way of a rare glimpse of two aspects of their teaching forbidding marriage and abstaining from certain foods, verses 3a and b, the latter of which elicits an intertextual intervention in two parts. The intervention reaches back first by reference to foods, the Greek is bromaton, to Genesis 9-3, which specifically invalidates any such food abstinence. And it also reaches to a broader tradition about the divine provision of foods, Genesis 1, 29, 2, 9, 2, 16. Uh, you could compare Deuteronomy 26, 1 to 11. Then the subject-verb combination in the correction, foods which God created, and the subsequent explanation for the whole creation of God is good in verse 4a, combined to recall the creation account and God's concluding assertion that all things he created were very good, Genesis 1.31. By calling up that divine pronouncement, 
Paul is able to give his unequivocal response to this aspect of the heresy. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. And read closely in that text, there is an echo or a shade anyway of the teaching in 1 Corinthians 10, 26 and 30 in the context of foods offered to idols. The same logic occurs there, the same requirement of thanksgiving. While providing Timothy and other church leaders with the scriptural precedent necessary to correct the erroneous ascetic, ascetic practice, the intertextual intervention also supports and extends the characterization of the opponent's dangerous incompetence as teachers of the law. Going back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, where it says these false teachers claim to be, desire to be teachers of the law, but as the author says there, they don't know what they're talking about. And this bit of uh, doctrine in chapter four of 1 Timothy is a case in point for Paul. So there we have some um, uh, examples of characterization of the opponents. Um, for comparison, Titus 1.12 provides another example of characterization of the opponents in Crete by means of an intertextual thrust, but it is not back to the Old Testament. It is into the Cretan story itself. Paul draws from the cultural narrative and deploys the well-known Cretan reputation for dishonesty and depravity, which he epitomizes in citing one of their prophets, as the text says, Maxims, perhaps a combination of Epimenides and Callimachus, to vilify the opposition. The intertextual illusion is graphic and the intention is unmistakably simple, showing no regard for the philosophical conundrum that is actually located in this uh, saying, the so-called liar's paradox. Paul, the Paul of Titus is, un, is not interested in that. He, he is um, capitalizing rather on the biting three-part criticism. Okay, we move on then to uh, the characterization of Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 9 to 18. Although Pauline self-reflection is somewhat thematic in the pastoral epistles, developed to underscore the link between the apostle and the authentic gospel, 1 Timothy 1, 11 to 16, 2, 7, Titus 1, 1 to 3, 2 Timothy is virtually structured around this sort of self-reflection. Chapter 1, verses 9 to 14, 2, 8 to 13, 3, 10 to 12, 4, 6 to 8, and 16 to 18. And its corollary, which is suffering. The definitive reflection is the final one, which we're going to look at, chapter 4, verses 9 to 18. It appears at first as a closing commentary for the letter. The definitive reflection is the final one, uh, in that commentary, there is reference to people movements, practical instructions for Timothy, uh, a description of Paul's situation in prison, but the reference to Damas's desertion in verse 10, which is hardly business as usual, and actually picks up a theme at the end of the first chapter, that reference puts the audience on alert. When the discourse reaches its climax in verses 16 to 18, a portrait of Paul in the image of Jesus Christ emerges, subtly constructed by intertextual engagement with the Passion Psalm, uh, Psalm 21 in the Septuagint. Surely also there is a reflection of the Jesus tradition, Mark 34, Matthew 27, at least that's where it resides for us. Now, the verb of abandonment, eg catalepo, I've put in little helpful signs here in the target, as well as colorizing. Uh, the verb of abandonment is used first of Damas, verse 10. It's repeated in reference to the desertion of everyone at Paul's first defense, verse 16. 
The double occurrence of the verb is the intertextual, as I would put it, the intertextual vestibule. This is picking up on Jeanette. Or the entryway leading into the psalm, 21.2. Okay. And there you can see the linkage of Ekatelepo with Psalm 21. Although the hearer or reader might wonder exactly what had been entered through this uh, echo, once inside, once the reader takes the bait, echoes of the psalm come fast and strong, leaving no doubt in my view. First of all, there is the distinctive metaphor of delivery in 417. I was delivered from the lion's mouth. Psalm 21, 22. The pairing of the verbs ruhamai and sozo in 2 Timothy 4, 18, which is thematic in the Psalms and occurs in Psalm 21 at verses five and six, verse nine, and 21 to 22 in parallel Hebrew parallelism. Okay, so we have the repetition or the mimicking of the psalm verb structure. Thirdly, the occurrence of references to the kingdom, Basileia, in 418 and in Psalm 21, 29, in each case associated with the Lord, Kurios, and number four, Paul's proclamation to all the nations, which picks up the psalmist's assertion that all the families of the nations will worship the Lord who has dominion over the nations, Psalm 21, 28, and 29. Now there are thematic, occurrence, uh, thematic coherence is also notable, as Paul's experience of the Lord's presence and empowerment and help echoes the psalmist's repeated cry for God's presence and help. Oh, I'll leave it there, slide eight. Go back, Saul's proclamation, okay. Psalm eight, slide eight. In fact, the verb, uh, pareste first describes the dramatic descent of the Lord in a cloud to stand by Moses. And Moses' experience becomes one to be enjoyed by any of God's people, as we see from Psalm 108, 31, Wisdom 10, verse 11, an experience that was reenacted within the community in the tabernacle and then the temple. But what Paul has drawn in uh, through this mixed intertextual citation, um, not only takes, not only evokes the memory of the Jesus tradition, Christ on the cross, Christ suffering, Paul facing his execution, but also brings back that note of the presence of God as the, uh, well, as first of all, an Old Testament trope for sure, but as a symbol that sets Israel apart from, uh, from the nation surrounding Israel and also sets Moses apart as a leader. Now, if one were to memorialize the Apostle Paul, or if this was rather the Apostle bent on leaving a lasting impression, the theological meaning of his suffering and martyrdom in Rome for his successor Timothy, constructing his final scene around the Passion Psalm and on the model of Christ's experience of suffering and abandonment would certainly be an effective device. Some will say this sounds a lot like Colossians 1, where Paul says there he is, his own suffering is filling up what is left or incomplete of the suffering of Christ. But I think the, through intertextuality here, Paul takes another step, or the writer takes another step, step in uh, characterizing Paul in this way. In the context of the letter, this, including, this concluding intertextual depiction 
invites a quick return to similar but less well-developed self-reflective texts that also involve intertextuality, though the pretexts are not exclusively Old Testament texts. Three texts, 1, 7, and 8, 11, and 12, 2, 8 to 13, 3, 10, and 11, reflect on the Pauline persona, the first and the last uh, of these I've mentioned, we just consider very briefly. Engaging with the Old Testament within the larger discourse of the command to Timothy concerning his gift, his shame and suffering in verse 8, and the command to guard the deposit, classic Paul emerges through at least two intertexts. The first is a reference back or a connection with the, t- the statement in 1 Timothy 2, chapter 7, that Paul is teacher, apostle, and etc. Uh, this reaches back, or at least will evoke the memory of 1 Timothy 2, 7. Um, the second intertext replays Paul's gospel and shame discourse in Romans 1, 16, and the language uh, for, for this, I would direct you to that Biblica article. The language uh, makes it clear that Romans 1.16 is in the backdrop. Notably, these associations are interpretive of the Pauline self-description, or of, um, he, uh, he calls him and associates himself with Christ by describing himself as Christ's prisoner. Paul's situation is the outcome of his willing association. Okay, finally, um, I come to the conclusion. Uh, This is a work in progress. The literary critic from Yale, he's now passed away, Harold Bloom, uh, in, in treating intertextuality or allusion in the poet, spoke of the poets when they wrote, sensing or feeling a kind of anxiety, a kind of indebtedness, and the obligation to engage with those who have, went bef- who have gone before. And if this is Paul writing the pastorals, and even if it is not, there is a sense of anxiety in a Pauline church, or let us say within a Pauline school, to continue to deal with Paul. In our own sense, we have this anxiety and commitment and obligation to consider to deal with what we regard as our sacred text to make it fresh, to find ways to apply it, uh, reshape it um, with some limitations and so forth. Um, my sense again, as we, as we think of uh, the research of the pastoral epistles going forward, is that intertextuality as a feature of textuality is here to stay, and now it's on the surface and visible for all of us. Um, I show it here in in relation to the way in which characters are created, and I suggest that this is something we don't find in the earlier Paulines. Uh, We find Paul reflecting on his own persona, but not in the same particular way or to the same degree. something is going on in the pastoral letters. Perhaps it is Paul looking at his execution, wanting to give something special to Timothy. And so he gets more creative in his use of of the Old Testament and other texts. That's possible. Or we have now a methodology uh, for keeping alive uh, the apostle hero for the Pauline church going forward in some sense. The work, as I say, for me, is in progress. There's a lot still to go, Uh, but I will leave it at that for now. Thank you.